You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to www.nakedbibleblog.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast. Today, and in fact for our inaugural podcast, we want to jump into the subject of baptism. The subject of baptism is a favorite of mine because it's a telling example of a point of biblical theology that virtually everyone would think they understand, but it's one that rarely gets close attention when it comes to the biblical text. Now I know what you're thinking. Come on, Mike. Everyone knows about baptism. What's there to think about? A lot, actually. And I'm not just talking about the debate over whether infants should be baptized or not, or how the mode of baptism is performed. What I'm thinking about goes a lot deeper than that. Christian traditions rarely examine the theological dilemmas that their own positions on baptism cause by creating tension with other points of doctrine. Now, you may not believe that, but I think you will after we're through. In this first session... I want to briefly define two terms so we're all on the same page. There are a range of viewpoints and associated jargon that come with the topic of baptism, so we need to cover them. First, there's what's known as believer's baptism. That's the belief that only those who have first made a profession of faith in Christ as Savior are proper candidates for baptism. Once baptized, believers become members of the church. Now, one result of this view is that only regenerated believers should be church members. The mode used in believers' baptism might be immersion. It typically is. That is, dipping the recipient in water, but it could be sprinkling or pouring. The mode is therefore incidental, at least for this discussion. The key idea here is that the recipient of baptism has to believe before they are baptized. Now, the second option is infant baptism, which is also known as pedobaptism. This is the notion that infants, before they are able to believe in Christ, should be baptized. The mode is nearly always sprinkling or pouring, although some Greek Orthodox congregations do immerse infants quickly, I might add. The perceived purpose or effect of baptizing an infant varies. In Catholicism, this rite is thought to remove original sin and brings the child into the church, the body of Christ. This idea is often labeled baptismal regeneration by Protestants, but that shouldn't be equated with salvation, though, regardless of what Catholics or Protestants might think on a popular level, since other sacraments and practices are necessary for salvation in Roman Catholic teaching. However, the removal of the sin nature removes the condemnation of Adam's sin from the baby so that if it should die, its destiny in heaven is secure. Now, in Protestant or Reformed churches, the meaning of infant baptism varies. The baptized infant does not have the sin nature removed, like in Catholicism, but the infant is made a member of the church. But while Protestants don't want to sound Catholic, a Protestant minister is still likely to presume and teach that the baptism of an infant would have something to do with the infant's secure place in heaven should the baby die. More broadly, though, in Protestantism, the relationship of infant baptism and salvation is pretty muddled, even within some very famous creeds, and I'll show you some clear examples of that uh, problem in later podcasts. A fair generalization might be that infant baptism supposedly starts the child on the road to God, so to speak. The baptized infant is said to have been accepted into a covenant relationship with God or Christ, which has some connection to salvation in that Protestants of all stripes believe that the child will eventually, quote-unquote, confirm their baptism. Since baptism was a sign of election, after all, just as circumcision in the Old Testament was, or at least that's presumed. In other words, Protestants link infant baptism to being placed into a covenant relationship with God. The problem, of course, is that many baptized infants grow up and do not believe, even though they are children of believing parents. This conscious or unconscious linking of baptism and election to covenant relationship is 
therefore presents a dilemma in the case of those who don't confirm their baptism. It gives rise to questions like, did the baptism not work? Whatever that might mean. Did election fail? Or maybe there's no connection between baptism and election, in which case, what exactly is baptism good for and why is it necessary? Or maybe the Calvinist idea of perseverance, that is, the idea that the elect will, in the end, believe. Maybe that should just be scrapped. But if that's the case, that also raises the question of the necessity of baptism. If an elect person will believe in the end after all, baptizing them as infants doesn't matter. It's usually at this point that Reformed parents or pastors will say something about baptism being needed for getting the baby into the covenant in case it dies before profession of faith or something like that. I really don't know how that reflects the Reformed idea of faith alone, but that question is usually avoided. And these questions really are just the tip of the iceberg. Now less important for the theological meaning of baptism is the mode, that is how it's to be done. We've already touched on that a little bit, but while we're introducing concepts here, we should say a few things about that too. Baptism by immersion, again, refers to dipping the recipient under water to illustrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Baptists do that once, while brethren churches typically dip the recipient three times. It's called triune immersion. They do it in the name of the Father, and then of the Son, and then of the Spirit. In the mode of sprinkling, the minister or priest dips his hand into the water and sprinkles it onto the head of the recipient of baptism, whether they're an infant or an adult. And pouring would be just what it sounds like. The recipient gets a lot wetter than he would if he or she was only sprinkled. I think it's time for a challenge uh, in our thinking about baptism. Let's start with this problem or this issue. Where in the world do various denominations get these ideas? While they would all say the Bible, that can't be coherent since there's so much divergence. In reality, these ideas come about on the basis of certain presuppositions brought to various passages, and here's where I get into trouble, sloppy thinking about the results. What I mean by the latter is that people are content to not examine where certain ideas lead, assuming that ideas can be held in theological isolation from other parts of theology. It really never ceases to amaze me how disconnected and incoherent the topic of baptism comes across in sermons, Sunday school teaching, and even theology books. One example will suffice for the time that remains here in this first podcast. In Colossians 2, 11 and 12, Paul tells us the following, In Christ also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. Now, all positions on baptism rightly note that this passage has some connection between baptism and circumcision. Paul doesn't really tell us what that is, but that's okay. He tells us enough that should keep us from bad theology, but unfortunately it hasn't. Now, what I mean by that is that there's a connection between baptism and circumcision. Okay. If there is a connection, then it seems reasonable to think that what we say about the meaning of one ought to be consistent with the meaning of the other. Sounds simple enough, but it's rarely followed. Now, insisting on this consistency between the two items Paul links eliminates common ideas like baptism erasing the sin nature or baptism have something having something to do with the forgiveness of sin, or that baptism guarantees anyone's eventual faith, since circumcision did none of those things, according to the Old Testament. The Old Testament is filled with episodes, even on a national scale, of Jews who were circumcised 
falling into apostasy. Their circumcision had no necessary connection to being believers. And when circumcision was first commanded of Abraham back in Genesis 17, all his servants had to be circumcised too, whether they believed in Abraham's God or not. They weren't even asked. And if circumcision, and therefore baptism, has nothing to do with the forgiveness of sin or faith, it can't be used as a basis for things like believing infants who die are in heaven because of their baptism. It's not hard to press the presumed meaning of the connection between baptism and circumcision even farther. What about women? That question needs answering since women were not circumcised in Israel. And by the way, that isn't a silly thing to say either since Middle Eastern cultures, even in modern times, practice female circumcision. Since Israelite women were not circumcised, they either weren't members of the covenant community or membership in the covenant community was not exclusively linked to the act of circumcision. And that issue would certainly affect how we'd look at the meaning of baptism. I hope you can see that there is actually a lot to think about here. In the podcasts that follow, I'll be giving you answers to these and other questions that are rooted in the text of Scripture, not in a theological tradition. My focus over the next few podcasts will be infant baptism, and after that's covered, we'll move on to some other things. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.